All the tabletop role playing news. We aim to amuse and we aim to enthuse. And Morris is unofficial tabletop RPG. Hello, 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 and welcome to Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk. I am Russ, aka Morris or Morris, aka Russ, and with me this week is PJ Coffee from the Southampton Guild of Role Players. Russ has ever. I am delighted to be here. And joining us also, we have in her lane, unhurried, unflow, moisturized, thriving. It's the one. It's the only. It's it's me, Jessica from EM Publishing. But again, we are not alone this week. A fourth figure looms in the door. PJ. That's indeed. Once more, we are continuing our streak of being joined by titans of the industry. I'm a big fan of his work on Blog of Holding, where he said, you know what, we could probably put every single monster in the monster manual on the credit card. And then the absolute madman went and did it. Like, just, just to be clear for listeners, I don't mean he, like, got like and change all the fonts really small and then do that way. No, no, he actually, you, you know, don't worry. It'll, it'll come on clear as we talk, as we talk. Worked on The Monstrous Menagerie, which has been an absolute stonker of a book. Also on MCDM, Flea Mortals. And some say he does bear, bear a startling resemblance to the angel Lexial. It's the one! It's the only! It's Paul Hughes! Hello. <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> you that. see why I get PJ to do the introductions. That was an epic introduction. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. I'm, I'm a fan of Paul's. Uh, yeah. Very, very the science there. That's all. So, so for those that can't actually see the screen and can't actually see, you know, what's, what's going on, Paul is currently sitting with sunlight cascading down onto his face and he positively looks angelic. He looks like and some kind of divine figure manifesting. <laughs> just just to put it the record, the, the light <laughs> is not actually shining. It actually emanates from me. Oh, right, right, of course. oh that right, makes of course. sense. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest, um, the rest of us are feeling quite cophonic and troglodyte by <laughs> comparison. Mm. <laughs> I was just saying this before, but uh, one of the new monsters in the Monstrous Menagerie 2 is the Archangel Lexio. And this is not, you know, a continuation of the bit. But when I saw the art, I thought, how did the artist get a picture of me? <laughs> so, um, well, to, to be fair, it's not hard to get a picture of you. Yeah, it, it, it is there on the internet, so maybe, maybe they did. Yeah. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, carry no. on the paper. It's anyway, a, shall we paper. dive into some TTRPG news, and then we can talk all about the Monstrous Menagerie, which is our favourite book at the moment. Yeah. Definitely our favourite book. Yeah, uh, certainly one I am most excited for. I'm very excited for it. Like just in general. I will say that, you know, sometimes we do hear on this show that we are a bit focused on EM publishing stuff. I don't know. We just invite other companies to step up their game and do more stuff that we can be excited about. How about that? <laughs> yes. <Nice>. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, I'll say the first half. Throwing, throwing shade things. on the entire industry. <laughs> wow. I, I just want them to write more stuff. How's that for a that's, that's, like, that's somewhat <laughs> ironic, given given one of the news items today about Kerbal Press. But we'll get onto that in a minute. But oh, first of all, I wanted to do a quick update about Daryl. Yes. So Daryl is um, our sound engineer and editor of the podcast. He is a columnist on Ian World. He's been working with us for oh, years, years. We mentioned last week he'd uh, he'd had to go into go into hospital. And there's more details about that, which we can talk about now because he's made them public on a GoFundMe. Um, because he, uh, unfortunately, you know, as, as happens to people in America who become, who become ill, has medical expenses mounting up. So he had complete liver failure, apparently. Oh my God. Has had multiple surgeries. He's still in, I think he's been there for three weeks now, still mm. in hospital, hasn't been discharged yet. Um, obviously he's not, you know, going back to work for a bit, but he has a, he has a GoFundMe as well to help and we'll put the link in the show notes for that so if you if you can afford it and then, you know i know it's coming up to christmas and i know it's you know but if you can afford it i'm sure he would be really 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 grateful just to throw in a little bit just to help with his um medical expenses and we you know we just wish him well and hope he returns to full health soon yeah I, I, i've missed his christmas and birthday for several years now so yeah maybe mm. this is the time for me to get involved yeah yeah, well, get well soon, Daryl. We miss you, but, you know, don't feel you have to rush back. Take your time, get healthy. And we'll be here when you get back. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Yeah. All right. Let's do some TTRPG news. What should we start what? with? Should we start with Star Trek? Yes. Who'd like to do Star Trek? Do you want to do Star Trek, Jess? Because you mentioned it before we started. I do. I'm ex- I don't know a huge amount about it because we only have a little bit of news, but Star Trek Second Edition is mm. out and available and it has a starter set. And I do love a starter set, so mm. I'm quite excited about it. So, yeah, it's available now for pre order. It's got a three part adventure. It's called Infinite Combinations. It also comes with a rules booklet, pre generated characters, reference cards, tokens. So, it's very similar to our starter box sets that we do. So, it's if, if you like them, then, you know, mm. it's got all the stuff that I think you need in it. It's just £24, which is a really reasonable price for a starter mm-hmm. box set. So if you pre-order it now, you do get the digital version right away. Mm-hmm. Um, they're planning on getting physical copies out in the new year in January. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it looks really good. I actually haven't played Star Trek Adventures. I've read through it. I really like it. I've had some friends run a campaign that I, I didn't have the time to be in, and they all loved it. And everyone I know has really enjoyed Star Trek Adventures, and I think it's my kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So maybe this starter box set is the thing maybe. I get to run it. Maybe. Because I think running a game for the first time, if you start a box set, it feels so much easier because everything's kind of there for you and you run out of excuses not to run a game. Yeah, yeah. For me. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that will be coming out in in January, the physical version of it. And I really like that it does have an overview, a 48-page booklet of the system. Yeah. And because I think those are just really good, even if you have the full rules, to have on the table when you're running yeah. just as a quick Yeah, game. I mean, it's powered by modifies his 2d20 system although it's an updated version of it mm-hmm. you know, star trek second edition because they, they tweak the 2d20 system for each game don't they yes it's not identical in each game mm-hmm. so this star trek second edition is another updated version of it i guess yep. but you know i'm a massive 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 trek fan and trek nerd mm-hmm. That's true. like one of my one of my biggest fandoms i think about probably ahead of D, to be honest mm-hmm. Yeah, so you'll I be love, getting this. Love a bit of Star Trek. You know, uh, it's called Infinite... What was it called? Infinite Diversity, Infinite Combinations. What was it called? Infinite the, Combinations. Uh, yeah, so that comes from a Star Trek quote, which um, when they're describing about basically the nature of the galaxy and the, and the people mm-hmm. to be found within it, the uh, Star Trek sort of quote is infinite diversity in infinite combinations. So that's where that mm-hmm. comes from. And they use that quite a lot, in, especially in the, in the, in the TV show. And then I, I saw from the line, what was this? Uh, just bearing that, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Someone online went, when did Star Trek become woke? <laughs> Ni- 19, about 1966, right? Yeah, I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, wasn't that TV show the first show to have an interracial kiss on it or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and at, at the time, yeah, yeah. that was huge. Like now mm. we wouldn't think anything of that. Of course, yeah, yeah. But like then that was huge. So it's always been something that, would have been put in the. Box. It's always it's always celebrated diversity, hasn't it? Right from the yeah. start. So there's weird there's weird aliens like in the world. Why are we why were you worried about the diversity of human beings? That mm. guy's got five heads over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that no one had five heads. They did not have the budget for five heads in the nineteen sixties. No, exactly. <laughs> well, A lot of people had five forehead ridges. Though. <laughs> they uh, haven't explored the whole universe yet. So if there's infinite diversity and infinite combinations, there must be someone a, out there must have five, that heads. Has five heads. Yeah, fair, fair. <laughs> so, Can't argue with that logic. Exactly, and it is logic. Thank you for <laughs> acknowledging it as us. But anyway, that's the Star Trek news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I probably will pick that up to be honest, because I like you. I love a starter set, and I love Star Trek. Well, and if I you're love running a game, you know, so. you're running a game. Ooh, we can yeah. do some token D and D news. Oh, D and D news. Go on then. Yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll put this in the show notes. But there is a Kickstarter for Bastion Builder modular battle map tiles. Oh, which really? are supposed that to sounds be useful. Two. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously they're aiming it at six editions, uh, Bastion rules, but it occurs to me that uh, a certain game that I am quite fond of, which has which runs with Schmefanced Schmift edition, or it would also be complete compatible with this. Have would say Tales of the Valiant, or indeed pretty much any OSR game. Mm. So mm-hmm. this seems pretty good. It is all a whisker from funding with twenty eight days to go. And it, yeah, it's just like a whole pile of different modular tiles that you to, to build your stronghold with. Yeah, that looks really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, it does look really cool. So yeah. I'll try it out. Yeah. Well, that looks pretty useful. I'm going to refuse to look at it right now because I've spent too much money on crowdfunding campaigns this month. So I'm just going <laughs> to pretend it doesn't exist and not look at it. Otherwise, I'll, oh. I'll buy it. Probably, yeah. probably for the best. 
This, yeah. this is going to be a tough podcast for you, Jessica. <laughs> I think it is, there's just so many great tabletop RPGs out there that are constantly being made. And also they're made by really awesome people. So I want to get the stuff to support them as well. Mm. So that's how I justify it. I'm like, well, I'm getting this thing for me, but really I'm doing it to be kind to this awesome person. That's my real motivation, sure. Mm. sure, sure. Mm. Not, not yeah. things are shiny, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, are any of you guys familiar with the DC Heroes RPG, the original one from, from like forty years ago? No, no, but oh, I've yeah. heard I've heard a lot of people that do like it. I, I like it very much. I have it. I have it up there on the shelves behind me. But it was originally um, published by Mayfair Games, oh. and what it featured was a logarithmic attribute system. So basically, each score was double the score before. So if you had a strength of three okay. and someone has a strength of four, they're twice as strong as you. So that enabled them to basically go up to Superman by the time you get like 10 sort of thing without having giving Superman a score of like 3,000. 3, mm-hmm. are, are they twice as strong or are they 10 times as strong? Twice. I think I think it's twice. Uh, well, that'd be I can't remember. It might be 10 times. I, I, you know what? I can't remember. can't remember. No. One of those two things, though. I think it's twice, but it might be 10 times. But anyway, it was a system that did that. So, and it made yeah. basically have Batman and Superman in the same game, and it was, it was a clever idea, and it and it worked really well. I mean, it was it's a nineteen eighties game. It's slightly clunky in places, but it's I love the idea. There's been like uh, three editions, I think. The last one was in the nineties, and there is going to be a sort of reprint. So, Cryptozoic Entertainment is reprinting the classic version. With uh, they're calling it an archival edition of it. Okay. Um. So it's a, a reissue of the original, like the the whole game line, apparently, not just the the core book, in a in a box. And yeah, yeah, you'll be able to pick it up. It's got a coming soon page on Kickstarter with like three and a half thousand followers. And I'm I'm probably going to pick it up. I got to admit that and the Star Trek box set. I think these are a whole bunch of things that. It is going to be an expensive week for me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something yeah. which appears to have made its way onto archive.org mm-hmm. is the Red Dwarf RPG. Yeah, go on, tell me about that. Yeah, well, I mean, we mentioned the 80s. I guess this would probably be more 90s. Mm-hmm. But it's got that similar sort of old-timey vibe. And I don't know why I'm saying old-timey because I guess what I'm doing here, I'm doing a thing we call vamping, which is preventing dead air. I am just talking away, <laughs> chirping away happily to myself whilst I wait for the page to load up. Yeah, it's on the internet archive. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it is got it's, it is black and white. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got some stills from the game. It doesn't doesn't strike me as being a particularly like rules intensive book, but you've got some nice things like Space Core personnel file and then it's various skills. Yeah. And they, would, would you it's say it's similar vibes to the Discworld in that it's not like a really crunchy RPG system, but it's got the vibe and the tone of the genre and the setting? Is that would that uh, be a similar thing? You know, I haven't even looked at it in that much detail oh, okay. because I just saw Red Dwarf RPG and you were uh, sold. So who yeah, who yeah. published that? Uh, this was done by Deep Seven, um, okay, and it's been out of print since two thousand seven. So there we go. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, if, you want, if you want to have a look, oh, Deep then, Seven if... Press. Yeah, I'm just looking at their website now. Hmm. Grimworld, Legend of the Savage Isle, Raiders of the Red Storm. They've got lots of stuff on there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, it has been posted up by uh, Deep Seven Press as far as I can make out. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I'm a bit, bit unsure, to be honest. But yeah, it, it seems legit. I'm just like, if people want to have a look at it, it does look like a fun. Because uh, yeah, I've always been a big Red War fan. So there we go. Yeah, well, you're some sci-fi silliness, I guess. That's where yeah. where you would go. This is the UK version, by the way, not the US version. So if you're a big fan of the US version, I'm afraid both of you will be very disappointed. The US, US, the US version there of was Red a US Red Dwarf. Uh, there's only a, there was only like a pilot episode, wasn't there? There wasn't anything more than that, surely. Basically. I, I've seen the pilot. It is. I think that would be awful. It's on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> it is. It is awful. It is utterly, utterly awful. Somebody likes it because there's there's somebody out there for everything. Like the yeah, the, uh, okay, fine. The, the naked mole rat looks like a vampiric toe, and yet it also finds love. So I'm sure someone likes the US pilot of it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I j- okay. But this is the UK version. I was like, just to remove any shadow of doubt you might be having. Mm. Yeah. Look. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
Right. Uh, anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about Cobalt Press um, because there's a, a uh, this is definitely a minor storm in a teacup. I'm not trying to like elevate this into some major, major issue. I haven't but heard about it. It's intrigued to know what's going on. They, they posted a review of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm-hmm. The new 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah, that's exactly. And the review is basically a list of ways in which their Tales of the Valiant Game Master's Guide was better. Okay. Um, so it was kind of, yeah. So it was basically, yeah. I mean, my, my general philosophy when I'm promoting stuff is yeah. I'll talk up our stuff, but I, yes. I won't tear down other people's stuff. I know yeah. other people would approach things differently, but I kind of feel that's, you know, that's my, my approach. Uh, yeah. Promote your stuff without tearing down other people's stuff. If you don't like someone else's stuff, just don't talk about it. You know, I, I mean, the best advice I've received when I was getting sales training was probably not a good idea to mention your competitor's best selling product mm. and sell your own. I'm like, yeah. that is a really good point. I've taken that I little mean, bit of advice with me on my journey. Yeah. I mean, I get it though, because a lot of the Tales of the Valiant marketing campaign was very much like, hey, do you like D&D, but don't want to? give Wizards of the Coast your money, well, play Tales of the Valiant. Like the so marketing campaign, there's, there's kind of a bit of a, very I feel like, like there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, though, because they are very much partners of D&D. Their stuff is on D&D Beyond and things like that, which strikes me as odd because they came out yeah. strongly against D&D with mm-hmm. the OGL crisis yeah. and very, very clearly planted their flag yeah. and say, come and buy this. It's not from Wizards of the Coast, but, yeah. it's, but it's 5e. With in their, black and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they did that. And then, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I mean, like I say, it is a minor thing. It's not a big, big thing. It's just that it kind of exploded a bit, mm-hmm. probably more than it should have done online, yeah. I think. Yeah, um, I do I'm, get I'm the people. There's some devil buying Alienware vibe here. But, I mean, no, they, say, they say things like, as a GM with two decades of experience under their belt, the D&D 2024 doesn't offer us enough to justify the cost or space in our GM going to game backpack and things like that. And it's like, do you need to say that really about your competitors, competitor slash partner's product? I mean, last uh, week on the podcast, we all talked about the Dungeon Master's Guide and we didn't right. really compare it to, you know, other things. It was just there's good things about it and there's, yeah. there's things that would be better. But yeah, yeah it's a, it's a yeah. I don't know. We got the impression that choices were made to meet page count and get this on the store shelves as soon as possible. Oh, you know what I say? Yeah, I, I haven't got that vibe from it myself. But you know, a review is a review, and you know. Yeah. Um, but, so what happened? Did they stand by their review? They so, I mean, yeah. There's a there's a little bit of nuance to this. So it was posted by, and I'm not going to say that person's name because they have been getting apparently a bit of online hate. hate. Uh, so the person okay. who originally wrote that on Cobalt Press's site, their name has been removed and it's now credited as by Cobalt Press. And I think especially leave that as that if they've been getting them. Um, yes. yeah. yeah. No, I respect that decision um, to go private. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, they did mention that they didn't really see the article in its final form before it Cobalt went live. Cobalt Press didn't see the article. The actual author didn't post it on oh, one so, of the social so, networks. So they wrote oh. the review and then it was edited. We don't know how much or I, I, I couldn't tell you by okay. how much or, wow. or whatever. Okay. So Cobalt Press have kind of, I don't know about apologise, but made a statement, which I think okay. is fairly decent. It basically says, you know, we posted this, compa- you know, we posted this comparison yeah. and we've been listening to our fans and supporters' discussions. And what we take away, the feedback is... We're going to lift up companies and creators in the industry instead of tearing them down going forward. Yeah. And we're going to leave opinionated reviews for the community and press. There are other places to get that. It doesn't need to yeah. come from here. Yeah. Uh, which I think is fair. I, I mean, think that's we, fair we, as well. We, there is some good stuff. We've we've seen some good stuff. We talked to Macho, they, they, the lazy DM, Fly Flourish, on this podcast. Oh, sorry, not saying oh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, so it's, good, it's about a good book. It. Yeah, I'm not so, saying it's not a good book in its latest. Well, well apparently uh, Cobalt Press was saying it was a bad book. So, you know, yeah. there, there are flaws in it, but I guess mm. that can be true of any book. Yeah. 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 I mean, kind of the tone of the, and, uh, yeah, there was someone posted, oh, where, where is that? And this is, it's kind of mildly ironic because it's going to like big, big up our own book now because they, they posted, where was it? Because part of it was they started listing things like there were only 12 sample hazards in the in the DMG, but their tone 
tells that a Valiant um, GMG has 30. There are only eight sample traps. Tells that a Valiant has 20. There are only three sample comp uh, contagions in the GMG. Tells that a Valiant has 11, you know. And someone said... Mm. <laughs> like maybe that's not the uh, that's not the choice you want to make guys <laughs> well, so if, someone said if you're going to start boasting stats on how many hazards and traps and diseases and stuff no. that you have you probably want to make damn sure you are best in class oh, no, <laughs> <is it? laughs> tells, wow. a5e's tells trials and treasures or something like a hundred exploration challenges yeah more than you know more diseases and so forth right. yeah but that's not what everyone's looking for not everyone's looking for yeah the most number of those things yeah. and absolutely absolutely i, don't know. I, 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 funny. But, um, I get i get from a marketing point of view you want to kind of compare and contrast to other products because customers do yeah. care about it because we do genuinely get people coming in and asking oh why should i move to level up a5v instead of D D?" and i i as a publisher always feel really hesitant about trying absolutely, to say because yeah. i don't want to compare what i generally do is give them the link to the tool site i'm like look all the rules are available for free on the a5b tool site so go have a look and yeah. see what you think we're very, we're um, very careful because in that. it's it's not for me because i there's no yeah. way i can look unbiased doing that yeah we're very careful we don't talk about D D in a negative light we we basically say we love that game you know we love D, &D which is why we made our version of it and this is this is kind of what we want out of it other people's you know mileage may vary but yeah. we talk about what's good about our game not what we don't like about another yeah. game yeah, and, yeah and, absolutely and for listeners who are interested trials and treasures has about 80 odd as i recall exploration challenges mm. and uh dungeon Dungeon's guide pool what was it 100 um, that has one. that was <laughs> somewhere over 100 and yeah, yeah. that's a lot of traps that's something about grim to sky has 100 traps i must beat them yeah <laughs> well, yeah, yeah it might have 101 <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think yeah. I think Kerbal's um, yeah, yeah. I think Kerbal's statement is good. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's I think it's a minor thing. I get why you're tempted to do that. Like, do you want to do a compare and contrast to show your product's features? Like, yeah, yeah. I, you know, of all the things that happen in the gaming industry, this feels like a very so minor thing. Yeah. yeah, like there's there's so many companies like that are doing not great things that we have talked about on the show, and. I, think I don't part, know. For me personally, Cobalt Press is not a company that I'm. Yeah, part, part of it's about a sphere of expertise, though, because mm. you know journalism, reviewing critics, and things like that are one type of content creator. Yes, game producers are another type of content creator. Yes. I have my sort of like one foot in each world and have yeah. had for twenty years. Cobalt Press mm. doesn't really. They've just been a very, very good. Probably the biggest sort of third party five E. Yeah, um, very content successful. creator, but they're not national double book. Yeah, Rise of the Dragon Queen. Yeah, campaign, which was the flagship campaign yeah. for the other day. Yeah, but yeah. but they're not traditionally reviewers mm. and article writers about anything other than their own stuff. So, mm. you know, and there's there's a big difference between reviewing and previewing as well. Because I sometimes with because I do not D and D got referred to as a review, and I was like, actually, that's not a review. Not D and D does not review the the games. I preview them. Mm. Is, is what I do. I get the people on to talk about it. I showcase it. I I basically show the audience what the game is, and then the audience can decide whether or not they like it. Yeah. But I'm not a reviewer because reviewing something is a totally different skill. Oh, I don't review stuff at all. And, I used and, to yeah, twenty years ago. I just don't do it. Now. Yeah. Um, I recommend so, stuff I like, but I don't review stuff. I, I mean, yeah. criticism doesn't have to be negative or not mm. no. negative. Absolutely. It can be designed to help things improve. That's why we talk about positive criticism. Yes. You know, say something yeah. good, then say something bad, then say something good, because creativity is very, very hard. Yeah. It's easy to discourage people. Yeah. And some things are very subjective as well, in fairness, because like what one person likes, another doesn't. So yeah. as we've yeah. talked about on this podcast multiple times, like even the, the three of us on this show have very different ideas about what we like in RPGs sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, and I like it, but uh, I think the important thing is we remember to respect other people's points of view, even when, like, we don't approve them. Yeah, which is true. Like, you know, With some exceptions. Well, I mean, that's not for us. <laughs> yeah, an American <laughs> version of Red Dwarf, for example. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. okay. Well, thanks for explaining that situation to me, because I've been trying to avoid the internet for the last week because of the world and so i i missed that so thank mm. you for giving me an up-to-date and an overview so i don't have to dig around and find that out yeah yeah shall we move on to another piece of news yes let's do that all right yep. do you have uh, do you have any other bits and pieces for us pj oh i, I do have a couple oh as i said this this may be an unfortunate week for you because this is a kickstarter jess no no <laughs> it's is it called... one i'm gonna love 
I don't think it's the one you're going to love most of the things I've got. Okay. That's that. This All is right. Pico, a tiny bug's big world. And it does sound very cute. It, it is disturbingly cute, Jess. Disturbingly cute. Okay, it I'm going to click. I'm going to click the link. Okay, fine. Uh, on your own head, be it. It has things like it's got like a little, I guess, a wasp or a bee, still in the flower, but the wasp, but the bee person will say is in the bumblebee, but with pink and yellow stripes. Their clutching has a shield, a Coca Cola bottle lid, you know, or the old uh, flip top from a glass ones. And at their side, they are holding a needle, has a sword. It's a very heroic pose, made even more adorable by the fact that they are perched atop a flower whilst doing it. My goodness. <laughs> it is, I mean, I was like, the art alone is ludicrously cute. It is. Sold. It and is. they're playing a Nintendo game so they rebranded as a yeah. Pico Tendo. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This is yeah. too cute. Yeah, so mm. Apparently uses something called the Wild, Word, the Wild Words Engine, which is a fiction first system with narrative and character decisions. The rest, it is a D6 narrative dice ball, so, you know, be warned. Oh, then, I love a D6 narrative dice ball. Yeah, I know, I know. It's like, I'm, I'm going around the internet saying, like, what do you do this? Maybe. We just love this, absolutely. And, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just back it for a, <laughs> a one pound so I have access to the pledge manager so I can decide next month. So it's got 26 days on at the time of recording. Mm. Yes, for those of you familiar with... They have a they have a GM screen, which for placeholder art they've got the Vitruvian Man by Da Vinci, with a censoring black box over the offending bits with like this but buggier. <laughs> I, um, I, I I I they they are they are, do, they are doing well. And I have to say, if you could, uh, this is MythWorks, which is Vincenzo Fiore and Ray Chow, and. Uh, we've got Felix Isaacs in there as well. And yeah, they're based in Toronto, Canada. And this is just, it's funded. It's, it's so cute. <laughs> like, I don't know. My, my power description failed me. My power hmm. description failed me to convey the cuteness of this promo. But uh, all right, problem. I'm pledging. I'm pledging. <laughs> oh, no. oh, dear. <laughs> you know, the Smurfs role playing games up at the moment as well. Perfect. Interesting. You that's that's a dangerous one, one too. Uh, I mean, oh, Smurfs I... isn't hugely my fandom. No. Nah. I don't know if it's because there was one female Smurf and her personality was being a girl. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm like, I hate it when they do that. They're like, yeah. all these all these characters have unique personalities, and hers is that she's a girl. And it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, technically unique, but. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's doing well. It's at $120,000. Yeah. $120, Raised with seven days to go, so it's doing pretty well. And there's a lot of stuff in that set. There's um, yeah, there's like books and dice and a dice tray and it's like standees and cards, all sorts of things that you can pick up on there. Nice, nice. Sounds uh, so lit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. marvelous. Right, okay. What else we got? I, I do have one more thing. Uh, okay. Paul, are there any are there any projects that you're aware of at the moment, or have you just been so head down? Really uh, let's see i did i think this one is over now so this excuse me i've got a little bit of a cold <clears throat> yeah, <sorry. clears throat> angelic uh, people yeah yeah i know <laughs> the adventure time rpg yeah a kickstarter a bit ago i'm doing the monsters for that so oh nice so if if you're not sick of uh my monsters you could Grab that when it comes it's out. 5e based. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They've got their own twists, of course. Right, 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 right. <laughs> oh, very cool. Very, very cool. Oh, when, is, when is that coming out then? Because I thought, like, wasn't the Kickstarter already gone? Yeah, that's gone. The Kickstarter's over. And, yeah. Okay. But, you know, no no one except Ian World does the, we've got the book ready to go when the Kickstarter's over. Well, gone. that's true. That's true. <laughs> Although I have noticed that some some people are starting to do that now. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it starting starting to become a thing. I, I've seen a lot of smaller indie games as well. They have like the manuscript laid out without like a professional layout artist or art. Mm. And they just said, look, here's the core of the game, but I'm crowdfunding to pay for these things. So when it finishes, you can get it ready to play, mm. but I'll, we'll take the time to and use the funds from the crowdfunder to 
pay a layout artist and pay for art and all that stuff. So I'm, yeah. I'm starting to see that in the indie design space as well. Right. Which is great for someone who has very short patience. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's got a more immediacy to it, which I do like. Although mm-hmm. it does mean mm-hmm. that it don't really have as many stretch goal possibilities. But yeah, right. Right. yeah, that is the thing. Because people have said that to us about stretch goals, and it's like, well, we've kind of made it now, so <laughs> it's oh. kind of done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, effort, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. But uh, we, I have another piece of news as well ooh, that yeah, won't necessarily know. cost us money. But maybe for people in Canada, we've mentioned it before because they've kind of teased it. It's the Dungeons and Dragons immersive quest live experience. Oh, yes, there's some info so about that now, don't there we? There is some info. Yeah. So we heard about it before that they were doing this this live event in Canada that was going to be going on, and it's an official Dungeons and Dragons like branded thing. And um, we want more details about it. So it's in Ontario, and it's launching 18th of December, and it will be there for four months, and then it's going to move to another location in North America. They haven't defined where, I don't think, but it's moving to North America somewhere. But yeah, it's an experience that will last 60 minutes to complete, and at the end, there's like a marketplace, and it's got different goods and themed food and drinks, so you can like hang out there and still be in the world after Mm. you've gone through the experience. It's Partially set in Waterdeep and partially with a recreation of the Yawning Portal Inn. And the end market is a Waterdeep market themed thing. Hey, hey Jess, um, what, 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 what town is it in? What location in Canada is it in? Yes, it is in a town. <laughs> Where? In what, what, what town? Where? Oh my goodness. I don't know how. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I am. Ontario. Ontario is small. Mrs. Orca. Mrs. Orca. That sounds it's, like as it's, good as it's, it's, we didn't it's, ask who was yeah. running it. We asked where it is. Yeah. And if you'd like to read where it is, there's a link on Ian Wells' yes. article. But anyway, yeah, I wasn't trying to pronounce it, so I was skipping through that. Thank I you. I know you were. Yeah. Out, Russ. Thank you so much <laughs> in this live recording. But yeah, but the actual 60-minute adventure is you will be players and you're going to be set on a quest to recover a powerful magic gem from a villainous dragon. Um, so it's got immersive theatre, cinematic videos, multimedia stuff. So it's gonna. it feels a bit like have you? I don't know if you've done Secret Cinema or something like that. I've done those sorts of things. So it, it seems like that sort of thing. Mm. So it looks really fun. Price wise, tickets are ranging from like forty five to ninety Canadian dollars. Okay. So I, I guess there's different tiers of stuff. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like it's for an hour experience this thing after it. So maybe it's a bit of an event you're doing mm. with your friends. But yeah, and then it will be moving to North America. They have a website with more details, so you can look that up. And apparently this is one of two upcoming D&D-themed live experiences that are coming in the next few months because Universal Studios Hollywood is doing a Dungeons & Dragons fan fest night as well. But yeah, so that's what's going on. That sounds really cool. A bit too hard for us to go to, but... I've been flying over to... Yeah, if you're... I mean, too much to to go to Canada for, for me. For me, anyway. I mean, especially after you went over to Australia to do that to Cork (laughs) Cthulhu. Yeah. Was that New Zealand or Australia? That was Australia, wasn't it? It was Australia. Okay. In a prison in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Good times for Halloween. Um, anyway. And the final thing of news that I have, mm. yeah. as I say, it's not on the Kickstarter. I was incorrect about that. It's just available from itch.io. Okay. Uh, Jess, you're going to enjoy the name. It's a Unresolved Sapphic Tension. Oh, my goodness. A collaborative two-player TTRPG about oblivious lesbians. Okay, I'm buying it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's only five dollars. It is a bargain. It is a bargain price. Uh, it's by Alyssa Gabriel. It goes by a disaster queer online, and it's based on "I Have the High Ground," which was written by Jess Levine, also known as that Jess from Online. So, yeah, using rock paper scissors mix. <laughs> okay, it tells that's, story that's very funny. For reasons that we won't go into on this podcast, it tells the story of two obvious lesbians realizing that their romantic feelings for each other are not, in fact, unreciprocated. <laughs> it's a GMless game, and both players split the, split the responsibility of building atmosphere and directing scenes. I saw it, and I thought it was both the cutest and funniest thing that I've seen, even surpassing Pico, which we have wow. talked about. Yeah, so, you know, it made me laugh very hard. I thought it might bring a little joy to Jess's heart. It is. That feels like a really good summary of the Sapphic experience um, as well. So, (laughs) yes, downloaded. I'm downloading it right now. There, it's on my computer. It was a fiver done. Okay. There we go. One expensive week for Jess. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Well, I yeah. played Moonlight on Roseville Beach recently, which was great. And then my that same group of friends were planning on playing Thirsty Little Sword Lesbians soon. So mm. this can be added to that mix of mm. sapphic RPGs that we're all playing. Um, I hear I'm like this. <laughs> this is the podcast where you just spend each other's money. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hey. Mm. No, okay. I, I scoured the internet looking for things that will cost for us and just money. <laughs> In fairness, that was five dollars. So you know that feels like a reasonable impulse purchase. She yeah. says, making herself feel better about it. Okay, so all, all, some all these five dollars add up. Money. Though I know, Russ. <laughs> 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 Tell me something that won't cost me money. A critical role novel called Tusk Love. Oh my goodness, this sounds so funny. Yes, please explain this. <laughs> so in Critical Role, well, I, I don't really know the characters of Critical Role. I apologize. But I, there's an in-world in romance novel. Yes. In the, in, in, in the actual setting, yeah, is, yeah. Is there's a novel called Tusk Love. And it's being mm -hmm. turned into a real novel that you can go and buy and read. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, and it is it, everything you want it to be. It depends on what you want it to be, I suppose. But it is. Um, <laughs> it's been mentioned a bunch of times across the course of campaign two, mm -hmm. yeah. and one of the characters, Jester, buys the book in Critical Role, um, which features a forbidden romance between a half orc and a merchant's daughter, mm -hmm. and they they constantly refer to the book throughout season two of Critical Role. Yes, because uh, Jester, the character that Laura Bailey plays, is a little naive in the world of romance and, and love and things like mm. that. And so is, is reading this book and believing that to be the blueprint. And so there's mm. some fun conversations. So she's like, well, obviously, because that's what you do, right? And everyone's like, oh. Mm. So. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, the intro text is great. I think it's everything you'd want it to be. And if you're interested in romance and RPGs, we had Sam Parks on to talk about romance in RPGs. That's true, yeah. A few, a few weeks ago, yeah, yeah. But the intro is a merchant's daughter who yearns for adventure gets more than she bargained for when she falls for a broodingly handsome stranger in this saucy romanticy from the New York Times bestselling author of The Hurricane Wars. There we go. And it goes on from there. Well, it's coming um, out July 2025, and it'll cost you $30. July twenty twenty five. I have to wait that long. Mm. Goodness. Uh, like Paul, when you when you write when you write your book about like you know the fake court romances, Jess is available to do the voiceover for the advert. <laughs> that was that was a strong reading. Thank you. That was a cold read as well. I can give you five other versions if you want. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's I think that's really funny. That's nice because it is referenced in the campaign a lot, and it's quite a funny in joke that's in there. Yeah. So it's nice that it's actually being made. Okay, yes. and that that did make the brief of I can't spend money on it right now because it's not currently available. Good. Mm. I believe Critical Role are going on tour again. It does uh, sound like something they do. Yeah, they're doing a world tour which consists of five cities: three in the US and two in Australia. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that is around which, the which, world. Which is the world? <laughs> Yeah, and I think <laughs> mm -hmm. last time, like the people, who, the ticketing firm that they were partnered with said, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to charge like $1,000 per seat, which obviously. Goodness. Wow. Do, do you not remember this? This was like a big deal because people were like, but we don't want to pay $1,000 per seat. No. And this seems very anti the core thing about Ren Lee Milligan and critical role. Mm -hmm. So. I hope I'm getting this right. I do get my actual planes mixed up. Sorry. But yeah, they're supposed to be doing like a... Is it, it's Matt Mercer's Critical Role. I don't think it's Dimension Matt Mercer's Country. Critical Role. Dimension yeah. 20 is Brendan Lee and Mulligan. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it was something. They're going to do like a, a a lottery to let people have regular prices for the seats rather than just letting the ticket people just charge whatever they like as well. Yeah, I think it was... Is it Ticketmaster or something that does stuff like that? Because they basically yeah. increase the ticket price pricing. based on demand. Yeah. Does that happen with Taylor Swift's concerts as well? Wow, yeah. So, That's... concert tickets, they they went astronomical because everyone was trying to buy them. Mm. They decided to cut out the scalpers and just charge you ludicrous prices anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... All right. All right. I'm out of news. I think we are oh, largely done now. There was um, one one thing, that Tiamat in Amazon's Secret Level Anthology TV show. But this is kind of like an image, just an image, which you can't really do on a podcast so well. So I guess I'll, we can put a link in the show notes so people can click on that and look at it. 
but we've talked about Secret Level before. It's a TV show coming to Amazon in December, December the 10th. Yeah, I'm excited for this. A whole bunch of games. It's like an anthology show. A whole bunch of different games, mainly video games, but they are um, showcasing Warhammer and D&D as two of the episodes. Mm-hmm. And there's a screenshot of some adventures standing in front of Tiamat, and it looks pretty cool. Yeah, called Secret Level. And I'm yeah. looking I'm looking forward to this. I love uh, nerd culture stuff going mainstream in media, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm just not really familiar oh, yeah. with most of the properties that they're covering, sadly, because I'm not a big <laughs> video gamer, so... But you will watch... You could watch the Dungeons & Dragons. I'll watch the D&D one, yeah, and I'll probably watch the Warhammer one as well. Are you familiar with Pac-Man? I have heard of Pac-Man, yes. Well, there we go. So. Right, yeah, really good out of a Sandler movie, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, no, it's yeah. great when when D and D appears in in stuff I don't know much about because that means it's reaching a new audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, th- I think at the moment D and D's basically about as big as well, it's bigger than it's ever 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 been, hasn't it? You know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm trying to look at what a Pac Man animated show would look like. Well, you don't have to wait. Yes, someone's a running around the maze eating pills. Being chased by ghosts. Coasts, it's someone's drug I mean, trip, is what yeah. it is. <laughs> what wasn't this like the Crystal Maze as featuring Richard O'Brien? <laughs> oh, well, I suppose <laughs> slightly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll probably watch right. the Pac Man one as well, just because I want to know what on earth they're doing with that. Yeah. yeah. But, but sometimes you can watch TV shows and enjoy them if it's a good enough show without knowing what the IP is. I guess, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But anyway. Get, get off. Get off. Oh. Thank you. Speaking of being savaged by wild beasts, shall we talk about Monstrous Menagerie 2, Hordes and Heroes? <laughs> oh, I, yes. What, I say, what's the segue? It has many, many wild beasts. Yes. It does. Do we know exactly how many wild beasts it has? Oh, wow. Uh, Specifically beasts, or do you mean well, creatures in the book? Just cre- critters of the, various types. In the 300 range? It's around there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Quite a lot. Yeah. 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 So much of the we got quite a few authors who have contributed. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people who we've worked with before and some some new people as well. So I'm really excited to see how how you like all their work. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you uh you wrote something. What was your entry? I wrote a couple of things. Uh, can I talk about them? I can talk about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. course. Yeah. Anything yeah. you want. <clears throat> they're all, oh. they're all, we can talk about them all, but yours are secret. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the saddest face for people listening just appeared. <laughs> we've actually, oh, we've actually put yours in invisible ink. Yours in the book. Oh, goes, yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, Peter's are great. Peter is who I go to if I need anything gross. <laughs> <laughs> In life uh, or just in terms of... <laughs> well, you know, specifically I'm talking <laughs> about the game yeah, now. <laughs> but, no, but any kind of oozes, uh, gross, rotting plants, things that leave slime trails. So, yeah, there's... Amazing. That's in there. The natural world is a powerful source of inspiration to me. Right. Because it's grosser and more horrible than anything you could possibly imagine. Mm. This I, is... Gl- yeah. I'm glad I, I, I don't live in your neighborhood, but I'm glad for your inspiration. I, <laughs> Well, 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 to be fair, the worst I'm likely to come across is at having put themselves some, to make cobwebs on. But what you see online, it's very yeah. interesting. All, all you need to do is sort of Google some of the fish that live in some of the darkest yeah, bits of the sea. Absolutely. And some of those are proper, like Cthulhu West oh, yeah. monsters. Just mushrooms. Mushrooms, man, have a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny you should mention that, Jess, because that we, was a big inspiration, <laughs> right? So, and what, this is this is a theme that sort of emerged when I was in the first stages of the book when I was asking people what their dream things to work on were. A lot of sort of plant themes, mm. which I thought was great because that's usually an underserved mm. piece of the game, which is sad for the you know the character who like I could talk to plants. That's my thing. Mm. And it comes up once in level 17. Favorite enemies. Right. Yeah. So now you can. Yeah. And that was one of the things that we sort of did while we were putting this together is we started to put together themes. And that's something that we talk about a bit in the introduction. For instance, I think I might have one that I can pull up here. 
we have a plant theme where we sort of talk about how you could run entire campaign that went th- through through mo- the monsters in this book that is sort of plant themed so you could start out by meeting a heroic cleric which we'll talk about more a plant themed cleric who has a and you could gain a, a puffball symbiont as a permanent companion that's also a a heroic creature and we'll talk mm-hmm. about that in just a minute mm-hmm. yeah. but i think that's going to be really fun to get and then we can go on and and battle some of the horrible peter the the pj inventions <laughs> uh, cave trawlers and so on oh. uh, <laughs> will gaunted had a great crimson spore cap which, which is pretty horrible mm. i think that's on the cover art and that looks pretty grim uh, th- yeah i mean there's some also when all the art came in for this I was like, this this is great. I love how gross and dripping and viscous some of these things are. Mm. I did a bell jar, which was sort of a it's you know, because like who doesn't love Sylvia Plath in their in their uh, role playing <laughs> games? But yes. giant you know, you see a lot of uh, sort of the the giant mushroom forest in the background in fantasy, but it can suddenly become the foreground and mm-hmm. and grab you. And then finally I turned over to Cassandra McDonald, who is one of the design geniuses that yeah. that does the excellent dragons. Did, yeah, who did right? Who did all of our our big dragons in the first book mm. to do one of our reborn gods, Rizquithar the Consumed. Mm. So this is the final big bad creature that's going to be reborn if you, as the players, screw up, which you will, oh. uh, <laughs> and then. You'll have to battle this this reborn god that is that is rotting the world, and wow, what a campaign for the right players who like who who don't mind being squipped squinted yeah. down by a uh, mm-hmm. by all that. But uh, yeah, these themes emerged naturally, and we sort of leaned into them and made sure you could play them through from level one to level twenty. Yeah, I do like that in the introduction. So basically, each has like a couple of paragraphs and just talks about how you can run a campaign that is, you know, plant themed. Being one example, but there's like what, five or six different. There's a couple of different ones. Yeah, yeah. So and it tells you who you start with, all the way up to who the big bad would be, all using monsters out of this book, all right. totally different themes, which is pretty cool, pretty useful stuff. Yeah, I thought it was useful because a lot of times when you're starting a campaign, you're like, well, I guess we're just going to see what happens. Yeah. We're starting off with a starting town, and I have no idea. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you do have an idea that there is something called Risk with R the Consumed mm-hmm. uh, coming at the end, you can sort of, you know, clue that in. Yeah. I also like com- this little bits of world building as well with some of these because we've got a number of named creatures in this book mm-hmm. you know not a massive number obviously a lot of it is sort of generic creatures you can plug into any any game but we've got quite a lot of named creatures um most of them are sort of angels arch devils um fey lords reborn gods that sort of thing but these are all really really fun as well yeah, kind of like npcs almost but right yeah yeah <laughs> sorry that's a terrible way to describe that, but... right, right yeah and it is sort of a way to build out this sort of a common story because mm. uh, it is always fun to have a common story with the other people you play with and say mm. oh you know we how did your battle go when you when you faced dominus the mm. the fey lord who turned into a an arch devil yeah exactly <laughs> i like that idea as well so right, because a fey lord who you know, sort of ended up in hell or nolda as we call it Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that right. idea. There's sort of a the classic archetype going back, you know, hundreds of years of a lot of these these devils started off as something else, angels usually. Mm. But they can come from other sources too. So, you know, you could have somebody mortal who ascended to to become one of these people, a fey, and so we've played a bit with that. And it also makes things a little tricky when you see this urbane looking guy with the with the dragonfly wings instead of mm. leather bat wings you know who's can you know what what are this guy's motives yeah huh? yeah you're not really sure yeah Nefarious. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah so general story is something that that we wanted to explore more in this book you know how mm. can we build out the story through monsters yeah mm. yeah i mean we started off looking at 
in um, 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 Plain Strider's Journal, which um, I believe, um, Peter, just arrived, your copy of that just arrived literally as we were just starting the show. Yeah. yeah. So you haven't had a chance to actually open it yet. Uh, I, I have not, in fact, opened it all. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got the smell. Yeah, fulfillment yeah. has started for that globally. So, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's in, well, it's in, it's in publishing book, so it looks really nice. Has it got ribbons? That's the question. Well, so it's got um, ribbons. I know. Yeah. I knew the answer to the question. <laughs> I think you picked out the colour. I was like, which colour ribbon do you want for this one? Yeah. But anyway, yeah. But we we started like in in that book places like Nolder, which is our or the Pit, which is our version of Hell, and we've got our sort of like you know we have the Dreaming, which is the Fey Realm, and 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 things like that, and Sylviana, which is kind of our version of the Upper Plains. Mm-hmm. And we start we started building those out in Thanks Writer's Journal, but we build them out a little more in this book mm-hmm. in the Monster Entries, especially Nolder in particular, because all those archdevils and stuff we got information about a big city that exists there and who rules that city, the three archdevils that rule that city and things like that as a triumvirate. And it's very, very, very cool. I mean, what I like about it as well is I'm not a huge fan of existing lore because it makes me feel like I need to do homework normally. So I don't want to sit and read a history book about a world and feel like I have to learn it. But with the monstrous menagerie books, because it's monster by monster, you learn a little bit of lore and information kind of as you go. So as you drop them in your game, you're learning a bit more and it's slowly building it up as it's introduced to the players and Mm. as, as you're putting it in. So I feel like I'm not doing homework, which is... Always really yeah. nice for me as yeah, a GM. Yeah. It's like it's not a massive that's input. A great point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's the difference between a monster book and a, and a lore book is these monsters don't exist until they go into your game. Mm. So exactly. all that other lore that's sitting in the back there, that's that's nothing until it comes out onto the table. Exactly, exactly. I, I mean, but having said that, like introducing a monster when you're starting off, I know I used to do this, there's a temptation to have it appear in a, I don't know, a 20 foot by 20 foot room. Mm. And it's just, it's just there. Whereas one of the things that I really appreciate, I'm still using in my game of A5E, is the foreshadowing. As I love like, you know, yeah. It's the signs that there's things around. And sort of like, I call it an idle behavior because mm. the computer game methodology is very yeah. influential on my thinking about this sort of thing. Like, what? So, you know, how do you know the monster's coming? What is a monster doing when you get there? And when you first see it, there's a call for a roll mm. to see what you know about the monster. Mm. And right. that's got like, you know, 10, 50, and 20. And my, my players do, do enjoy this because I've got a real mixed bag of like real veteran players who've been playing for like, you know, third edition yeah. or un- and earlier. And players who are like, oh, this, uh, this D&D thing looks good. Right. Uh, well, they'll enjoy it even more now. They, they, those legends and lore tables they've got something new in them now they are yeah. so this is something that has been a big hit at my table every lore entry which you know includes what you learn on a say a, a 15 yeah. uh, history check also includes what you think you learn on say a one <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple ways you could play this you know there's some extremely dangerous misinformation in this book Mm-hmm. That, that you can get if you roll a, a bad mm. number. If you're playing a, a certain style, you might want to, you know, sort of as a as game runner, do that secretly and and get people the information. But myself, I like it when the players roll. They see, whoops! I yeah, got it I mean, they know they've rolled badly, and they know they know this is false. But it's just so fun. But they lean into play. it. Yeah, the right. Yeah. Oh yeah, this yeah. guy. I, mean, the I think this guy's friendly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, vampires. Oh, they they, <laughs> they they really like garlic. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's something that we added more of. And in general, I think that's opened up a lot of fun at their table. Mm. And also it's sort of opened up a lot of, uh, of puzzle monsters. Mm. That's something that our fantasy in general has a lot of. If you think about the Medusa, you know, you can't look at, at, at their eyes or uh, the, the, the D&D the, troll. But your defeat, your shield. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, these, these are things that it's really helpful to know about before you fight a monster. Mm. And that, you know, now most people know a lot of these things. Most hardcore 
players are familiar with a lot of these tropes. Mm -hmm. So it's great to introduce new ones, but then you have the problem of how do I make this fair? You know, if I'm like, well, this guy is only damaged by lightning, but there's no way to signal that. Mm -hmm. That's just potentially an exercise in frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if we include, you know, signs, the, the smell of, you know, this, the ozone smell of lightning in the air and some kind of behavior that they're doing and, and all these various tools besides the monster stat block, suddenly that unlocks all these interesting puzzles that we can include. I know, it's fair amazing. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, I mean it, you mentioned it, vampires earlier. Mm. And so one of the things I like about the monstrous menagerie is vampires can be affected by gold or flowers. So right. like, oh yeah, there's a table of alternate things that you can, yeah, yeah just to but, throw your players, yeah. So, so one of the things I, I was doing in a shorter campaign I was running was mm. they're going into a city and there's a lot of gold flower heraldry everywhere and they're like we do not understand and like the closer they get to the center or the governmental center like you know uh, the governor's palace the more they're seeing until it's like mm. you know, just the whole corridors and they're like we don't like this but we don't know why and then they come in and there's a, a halfling sitting on the phone who's of course wearing uh an opera cloak because mm. yeah, <laughs> that's what some things the same <laughs> and they're like, oh, oh, they're a vampire. Oh, and then they're doing the Legends of the Lord roles and like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. I like right, yeah. I like this approach as well because it, it suits different styles of play. Because like you mentioned, there's the signs and behavior, which, you know, the, the game master is describing the world. And so the players can kind of pick up on these clues. But also sometimes as a player, I am not picking up on any clues. And I'm like, hmm, I'm not smart, but my character is. Can I have a role? <laughs> mm, and then you can go right. to the Legends and Lore table and let them roll for it and then tell them the information. So it suits different styles of play, which is, is really nice. And again, especially... I'm talking about if I GM and I don't have a lot of time to prep, it's all just there for me. I don't have to think about this. Yeah. I don't have to build it out. I can just, it's there. Yeah. It's done. I just love how like in a monster, you basically on a page spread got everything you need to run the encounter from start to finish, mm -hmm. right from the signs before the mm -hmm. encounter to the treasure after the encounter, like yeah. everything from start to finish is there on the page. You don't have to go to any other books. You don't have to right. flip and do all this sort of stuff. It's all yeah. there. We don't really like page flipping that. Mm. One of Morris, one of your great innovations in the original book was we're not going to have any blue links that you need to click to find out what their attack spells are. Mm. Mm -hmm. They're in the stack block. They, in the stack yeah. block. If this is a spell they're likely to cast on round one, you don't have to flip. We include it in the stack block. It's right there. And yeah. That same approach goes for, for everything. And in fact, I'm so lazy, I don't even like to read a full page when I run a monster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I mentioned er, earlier, but we actually try to design these so you can just flip open to a page, start running the encounter without having absorbed the whole thing. Mm. You know, first of all, you roll the the behavior, then you take a look at the little tiny paragraph about what their but what their combat strategy is. You only have to look up the the abilities that that are mentioned right away, and and you can sort of read up during the. Uh, while the players are wasting their, their turns, you know, mm. trying to figure out what they're going to do. It's all about saving myself work. That's the whole reason I got it. These are definitely my favorite monster books. They really are. Yeah. I mean, I'm biased, but they are my favorite monster books. <laughs> uh, well, 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 speaking as someone who just, I don't want to spend hours while I'm prepping. I have found them extremely valuable, mm. which is why I'm looking, I, I find them extremely valuable. That's why I'm looking forward to seeing Jeez. what's new in mm. Mo Me Too. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of oh. what's new, we, I mean, definitely the the villains and companions that level up with you is a really cool sounding feature. But what what was the idea behind that? Like, what was the thought process that got that in the second book? I was like, can I get away with doing this? Can I, can I put <laughs> this in? I had a couple of things that I had been working on. And one of them was, you know, this is a real pain to make to make a villain. And then, you know, a recurring villain, and then uh, you face them again, you're two levels higher, and the villain is the same level. So mm -hmm. the, the ultimate climax is now this is easier than it was the first time. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have villains that level up. And I also had the, the, the problem of, oh, you know, my, my player's bear companion is really cool at level three, and at level nine is not so cool. Yeah. So this all came together in, 
the idea of what if we make it possible for you to level up any monster you want. So we built out a system for leveling up monsters that I found useful in in so many more ways than I had had first thought, you know, as, as villains, as sidekicks. And then I discovered there was a secret option, which we'll just keep this between us. This isn't, we're not putting this up. No, no one will hear this. No, yeah. You can actually play as a monster. So, you know, if, if you level up, what else do you need? If you want to be an owlbear, Mm. you know, you could just, so, so this is, this is a secret option because it doesn't really work with every month. So they're not designed to be players, Mm -hmm. but there are times when you can say, all right, well, for this session, I'm going to be this. Know, this, or, this cobalt or whatever yeah, we don't have stats for them yeah. right if, if there's something that's not maybe this mushroom ancestry. i'll be this mushroom <laughs> exactly yeah, and then we literally have my well, yeah, right. say... <laughs> oh, i'm trying to think of what we <laughs> haven't got i don't know I yeah, we've, got, um, we've got a lot of, uh, mm-hmm. oh here's it here's here's one that that could be fun we have a dragon wormling in this book mm-hmm. and that is something that Let's can level up and become you know, sort of gain the traditional draconic powers as you get stronger, your, your dragon yeah. wormling. And that's, that's a dream that I think a lot of player groups have had mm-hmm. where you find a dragon egg and you're like, oh, this is going to be, yeah. this is going to be awesome. But there's not always necessarily rules to support that. Another really good use of the leveling, being able to level up monsters, of course, is wild shapes as well. Mm, so right. if you're a druid character, you really like wild shaping into some, a particular, I don't know, you really like wild shaping into a skunk and you've really, really enjoyed wild shaping into a skunk and you just want to keep wild shaping into a skunk. <laughs> this is my whole You can now level up the skunk, the skunk. skunk. <laughs> Yeah, That's right. So, yeah, so really you can continue to do that even when you're level 10. That's right. You just, this is a, a really cool skunk now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So your 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 little skunk can gain more hit points. Its attack becomes more powerful. It can get other bonuses, sort of feet like pieces. Mm. And so, yeah, there's a lot of options that let you, if you've got a beloved NPC, you can keep that along with you. Mm-hmm. It is very very cool. I mean, also it opens up so much design space. It's almost like we should expand on it in a later book into a whole book all about that sort of stuff. But you know, that's. That's interesting. We'll, we'll have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. So that's heroic monsters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We also had horde monsters. Ooh. Right. Uh, and this is for the the hack and slash battle. One thing that we worked on hard is making our solo monsters feel epic mm-hmm. with. With elite monsters, and mm. we continue that. I'm, and on the other side I, of the coin, co- like, those are amazing. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I'm they're, glad they're, they hit. My players are like, oh, I hate this guy so much. <laughs> That's it's, like, it's like you're looking at a monster stat block, and he goes, oh, is there only like CR twelve? Oh, it's got the elite tag. <laughs> yeah, right. he's basically it, CR twenty four. <laughs> I, I mean, right. Yeah, they're not they're not losing the fights, but they're like, oh, this, oh, just son of a. Have some mm. more. You, you, I want you to feel sort of like these these fights take you to the limit. There, you win. Yes, you don't want to TPK every session, mm. but uh-huh. you do want it to feel like you were you you were there for a reason. Mm. And so we've continued that. And my players who have play tested with are very excited to see some of these monsters get inflicted on the rest of the world. Mm. <laughs> and on the other side of the coin, <laughs> yes, exactly. We've got horde monsters, which are, if you want to fight a big epic slicing through, you know, giant, giant hordes of, of small monsters. It's a lot like uh, minions in previous editions and in other games. But they're a little different. Hmm. They're tougher. Hmm. They're not quite as delicate where, you know, you can't just step on a shard of glass and you're dead. Yeah, minions were one-hit kills always, weren't they? One right. hit point, basically. Yeah. yeah. And horde monsters are, I hope this is a one-hit kill. And the difference there is sometimes with a creature that you're sure you can you can beat in one hit, they don't really feel threatening. You don't have to really bring your A game. Mm. But with these, you need to 
bring as much as you can. You need to use your high level spells, you know, to, to take these guys out. And if you don't, they're going to hit you pretty hard, but nevertheless, we've worked out the math. So we can throw a lot of them at you. And we've done a bunch of modeling, play testing, writing scripts that run the same battle 10,000 times. Mm, the uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, nice. Right. Because what I don't want to be responsible for is you go start to run your game and the rules say I can use this, these guys in a battle and it'll be a medium difficulty and it's not fun because it was mm. too easy or it's not fun because it was too hard. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of that sweet spot is is difficult but has been much easier with like the uh, the encounter balancing table and the back of the monstrous magic that has that has just like changed my preparation and made it so much easier i'm i'm always telling people about it whenever i have the chance yeah <laughs> yeah well i again because i'm lazy i don't like to go consult a book and add up xp numbers because who can add two numbers that are a thousand or, or higher does i get uh, that's that's way too hard for me <laughs> So I like, you know, I like the, the easiest possible guidelines, which, which don't sacrifice fidelity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's always the strength of a good book for me is can like, not can I as a GM fresh and bothered, like, you know, just really quite happy run this monster while everything's fine. It's like, can I in hour six or an eight hour session right. in turn five of like, you know, <laughs> this monster exactly. battle with six players, mm. can I still look at the book? know what I need and play that turn so it's fun for people rather than saying, oh, that does something. Mm. That's what. Right. Because that gives you more attention to use for for keeping in mind all the other stuff you need to be thinking about. Mm. The story and coming up with evil villain monologues. Yeah. Descriptions or what's going on. Yeah. Mm. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these named unique epic villains mm-hmm. that we've got in here. And we've got, how many have we got? We've got like one, two, three, four, five... Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like a dozen ish, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. So, I want to talk about some of those. So, what can you tell us about? And I like this one, Mosolith. Mosolith, the diamond well. This is the highest CR creature in the book, by the way. Well, right. Yeah, as well. this is 28, I think. Goodness. Like, if I remember That's correctly. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Andrew Engelbright did a lot of work on this one and on the story as well. Mm-hmm. And this is sort of. You know, there's the archetype of the shining noble dragon. And this is a sign of a sm- slightly more sinister take on this. Mausolith is a gem dragon, which is, we've got a couple of gem dragons existing already. Mm-hmm. And their lore is that they're secretive and they hide. And Mausolith is the answer to the question, why are they hiding? Oh. Mausolith is a tyrant, believes that all the gem, you know, dra- dragons should serve him and luckily doesn't pay too much attention to the mortal small folk most of the time, which is why they're allowed to have their own petty empires on the surface of the earth. But Mm -hmm. if you attract his attention, maybe that'll change. Mm -hmm. So this would be the, a good capstone, I think for a dragon themed uh, game. Mazalith is, is someone who you can, you can use as a villain, but also is the kind of villain who you can talk with and, and develop a sort of relationship with mm. over the course of multiple levels. Yeah. Not purely a just bring out the giant mini, slap it down on the table. Yeah. This is the first time we've I, seen I it. This. this is a dragon that goes beyond a great worm. I mean, Muslim actually has a retinue of great worms. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, this is like this enormous diamond dragon at the center of the world. And, right. scary, and a guard stuff. and, a, and a, a kobold guard, I think. Challenge rating 20 horde uh, mm. monsters. So these are quick to fight, but they are they are tough. Yeah. For even high level players. Yeah. And that's something else that we like to do is sometimes it can be difficult to challenge high level players. And that's where a lot of attention has gone in making sure that they have a fun time too. Mm. And it's just not a cakewalk for them. Yeah. Was the you recall offhand what the highest CR creature in Monstrous Menagerie One was? Uh, I bet it was the Tarrasque. It was probably the Tarrasque. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So but nothing else has risen to that level. Yeah, it's approaching. So, so Monstrous is approaching Tarrasque level. Yeah. 
Yeah. But the fun yeah. thing about the Tarrasque is, you know, a big fight like that is kind of a big multi-stage battle, you know, with you got to figure out how to maybe turn off their regeneration and then they they get like a Godzilla breath weapon and mm-hmm. and the battle can change throughout. And that's something that often you get at high level and you don't get at low level. Mm. So there's another monster which I'm really excited about people playing, and that is the Behemoth or or Behemoth, which is a new a type of monster, which is a huge sort of like multi level, the type of monster you can climb and then find a weak spot. You know, the eye mm. glows red, it swallows you, and then what do you do? But these aren't just high level monsters. We've got them throughout the CR range. So we've got a level or CR one behemoth beetle that you can fight and so level one characters can have that fun of climbing up on its back and trying to steal yeah exactly uh it's got like a softer underbelly but then it might just like drop down on top of you Mm. so you know making a whole encounter out of a single monster is Mm. something that let's have that at level one and level five and so on yeah so and we've got like what, half a dozen of those in there, I think. Yeah, so yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, like all the different, maybe. yeah, different CRs. Mm-hmm. They're pretty cool. One thing I really, really love, and I, we touched on this earlier, is some of that lower plane stuff. And uh, I love these these arch devils that we've got here. We've got Axia, and we've got Vindica, and. Right. And, and who's the other one? Dominus. Uh, uh, Dominus, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that and some of the little bit of world building we've done there as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked a little about Dominus, who's the fey devil. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vindica, who's the, the sort of uh, devil that's in charge of keeping order, is former angel. You, you, mm-hmm. Again, not everybody started in the lower planes. Oh. But then perhaps the one I'm most excited about is Axia, who I sort of think of as the queen of hell. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not perhaps her her title, but she is the, the keeper of order in law. Mm-hmm. And the battle against her will be a battle both against her and against the laws that she creates. Mm. So that's, again, a big multi-stage sort of puzzle battle where she she decrees something and from for the rest of the turn you can't use melee yeah. attacks and swords, and decrees yeah. something swords, swords shall not harm it's, it's slightly more complex than that but swords shall not harm me and then for that turn swords won't harm her you know right. or something like that that's right and so the players hear you know this this clue about what is the new rule mm. for this Round. For this fight, yeah. They've got to maybe guess, figure it out. And if they guess right, they can change their tactics accordingly. Oh, like in this one, it, it seems like she's not going to miss or maybe or something else. And there's a couple of different sort of rounds to get through. And this has been a big hit in playtesting. Mm. The, you, I was going to say, how ahead. do you prepare your players for this style of fight? Because some people, maybe they've just had, they're used to, uh, monsters not being this interesting and having this puzzle style to it. How do you like frame it for them so that they they're prepared and know that they need to approach it more than just 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 get in there and wail on it? Strategy isn't going right. to work. <laughs> right. I think some of that has to do with the way that we provide not not like an AI like in video games, mm-hmm. but a a sort of a script for what what this monster is going to do mm. uh, on turn one. Axia is going to invoke this law mm. and then the best attacks for her to use during that turn are these ones so you don't have to look through the stat book and figure this out yourself mm. as this designer i don't want it to be a secret i want you to be very clear what you should do mm. yeah i mean if you also do that with somebody's foreshadowing and things like that so you yeah. can you can prepare players in advance get them appropriately scared get them worried yeah. Maybe like a few sessions in advance, start dropping it in, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Yeah, this isn't someone that you run to. You run it's not, it's to not a random encounter, no. no. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> but, right. And another thing that we do is we've got encounter groups for each one of these monsters. So when you're looking at the devils, you can see, oh, look, my, my players are around level 15. Mm. Here are some good encounters that would be suitable 
And this looks like this is a bunch of minions of Axia. And oh, by the way, here's the treasure that they have. Mm. And then once you fought the minions, the natural thing is for you to see, oh, what's it? Now that we're level 16, you know, who are we going to be fighting? But finally, you're going to work your way up to these big named entities. Mm-hmm. And you've, by this time, you've fought a bunch of their, uh, the people who are working for them. Yeah. 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 I was, I was going to say, like, you don't have to have like a named monster as a puzzle monster. Like we, we were going to talk about the Sapphire Dun for it, which is kind of gross. I agree. But also, also I designed it because I thought it'd be fun to subvert expectations. Right. Okay. So tell us about, yeah. Tell us about your monster monsters. Yeah. Well, there's a couple. I've got like a, this mushroom that goes along very slowly. It leaves a trail of slime behind it. Mm-hmm. And if you get caught in the slime, you can find yourself, you know, in a sticky situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's in a sticky situation, mm-hmm. that that was that was the idea, yeah. And they move much faster than slime than they do when they're laying it down in the first place. So you, if you get stuck in it, then you pretty much need to either try and get yourself out, or have someone come and get you out. Mm-hmm. Um, and these things, these things are pretty bad. They'll they'll chuck slime at you. They'll they'll wallop you. They are like you know quite quite chunky mushroom. But this this environment modifying aspect of that as well, right? Yeah, yeah. it uh, changes uh, the battle. Hmm. the yeah. battlefield and i like the the sort of the horror this guy's really slow why can't i escape mm. um, yeah but 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 like uh, as i say if you if you like play play smart rather than just rushing up and just walloping it and throwing more damage mm-hmm. to it you are you know, like they're actually quite slow why don't we walk around mm. um, right. <laughs> that's always the question we could try walking away from them. why don't they're, we they're why don't we not there. go there <laughs> Uh, move away that's like the control. solution to so many adventures right. let's not play D D tonight <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why don't we just stay at the pub it's much safer yeah, here. yeah i mean you wonder about adventures <laughs> oh, but you can you can, yeah. you can you can use it to like you know maybe make some space and put some tactical play into it rather mm. than like accepting the fighters risk and, and the other one was did we get a cave crawler in the end mm-hmm. yeah so basically it's like uh, this monster that floats in a cave it's got like long dangling tentacles which you know like a sort of like a jellyfish right and And it kind of looks almost like a a sort of a background flavor monster the kind of thing that you'd throw in just to sort of set the scene until you realize that's not the case Mm. yeah yeah because yeah it's just it's just chilling and if you have a party where everyone's decided to play the most optimal pick and everyone takes dark vision then this monster is a lot more threatening Mm. because they're very good at hiding in the dark. Whereas if you've got a mix of players, some of them have torches, it's not keen on fire because it's very flammable, mm-hmm. which is fine up until you find yourself hoiked 20 foot up into the air by its tentacles. And it's like, you know, it's not very good at trying to kill you, but it'll give it a go. But if you set it on fire, <laughs> there is a countdown mechanic that start because I'm a big fan of countdown mechanics. Interesting. <laughs> And if you were to shout, oh, the humanity, then maybe you've already understood what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So it's sort of, sort of like a little bit of a puzzle as well. And like I say, it's, if you, if you dot like, you know, the most quote optimal and quote play, this, is, this monster is probably going to be more of a problem for you than if you're like, oh, I like human fighters. Mm, right. My guy yeah. is walking around with a torch and a sword. <laughs> My favorite kind of puzzle is one where, you can feel clever if you figure out the optimal way to deal with it. But mm-hmm. if you don't, you can brute force it. That's fine too. Yeah. It's a little harder, but you're not going to be stuck because you didn't figure out, the, yeah. the, you know, yeah. guess what, guess what the narrator is thinking. Mm. Yeah. The worst puzzle is when there's one solution. And if you can't find it as a player, you just end up feeling frustrated and feeling like you're stupid as well. So it's, it's great that puzzles have multiple ways to beat it or approach it. So yeah. Like, right. yeah. Wait, yeah wait if you just want to. Let's just hit it with our, our swords. That'll, that'll work. And if that's what you like, then that'll be a very satisfying uh, experience. <laughs> yeah. But some people do like to, to, to look around and figure out something else. Absolutely. I'll chuck a firebolt at it because I use firebolt because that's got the biggest damage die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I've been dying to tell people about this for literally months. <laughs> right. Yeah. It must be yeah. coming on a year. 
Yes. yes. Wow. Yeah. I, and sometimes it surprises I, um, me the length of time you forget when you start these things. Because, like, there's always quite a crunch at the end. But yeah. especially when you've got a Kickstarter uh, coming up. But then you look back and think, oh, my God, we started this two years ago. Right. Yeah. And then the rest of the time go. And now here we are and we have a book and it's amazing. Right. It's so fun. It's so great to see. And as a writer, it's so great to see the actual, the layout and the amazing art that came into being. What's your, what's your you favorite bit things? of the, of the design process? Cause for me, it's when the art comes in, especially if it's art of something oh, I've written. When the seeing art comes it in is really, cool. I love that bit. Love it. It's a tough one. I think it's when you're starting to, you have a problem that you're trying to solve mm. and the feeling when you wait, I think this is it. I think this is how we crack this. Mm. That's very exciting. And that can, you know, that can keep me awake all night because I, you know, I'm just so excited about, you know, is this going to work? I can't wait mm. this, you know, to see how this works in a game. Yeah. 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 My favorite part of the process, which I think speaks to because the part I do in it is when people get their physical rewards, like the moment earlier when PJ was getting their plane strider book. And I think that's because I, my role in it, I was doing the logistics and the publishing side of it. It all happens when the crowdfunder happens. Mm -hmm. After that's happened, after the book's been made and when it's a thing, that's when I get to come in and do it. So my I, favorite bit is that. I thought, I thought your favorite bit was filling out the customs forms. I do love that. <laughs> yeah. No, I do. I do a lot of customs and tax forms, but that's that's the means to the end. Yeah, um, the price you I, have to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. my favorite bit of the process. I think it's interesting that you were talking about the design part because that's the bit you're doing. Russ, you're like the publisher, so it makes sense that when the art's coming in and it's becoming a full flesh mm. thing, that that's yeah. So yeah, yeah. 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 Well, also when the layout comes in as well, because layout transforms. Oh yeah, it really does. It's so so important. Like, I I just I don't know. Just like a good layout just blows me away. Yeah. Do you have any favorite art pieces that came in for this book? Ooh. I do. Oh, I, I know. Love yeah, the know Fey Dragon. Yeah, because uh, it's yeah. kind of and it's, it's uh, there's an image of it on the Kickstarter page if you want to have a look. But it's kind of got like a flower plant like head and like a almost like a carnivorous plant sort of more mouth and then the wings are kind of insectoid butterfly like and then mm. like a dragon body and i i yeah i just think it looks really otherworldly and different mm -hmm. um, i like the yeah. i like the blight the blight giant it's very good that's I a very it's nice really piece. cool and sort of yeah. dripping with the green yeah like lichen yeah i love the cover as well I mean, I love the cover to the yeah. first book. I love the cover to this book. Someone did ask me yesterday, have I uncovered your secret code? Because Monsters from Nashville had a one-headed dragon, dragon, one -headed yeah. dragon on it. Monsters from Nashville 2 has a two-headed dragon on it. Is Monsters from Nashville 3, has it going to have a three-headed dragon? we keep this headed? pattern going? <laughs> yes. I love how they've already decided that. Like, well, obviously you're making Monsters from Nashville 3. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, there's no, there wasn't, the question wasn't, what are you going to make it? Yeah, it was yeah. like when you do with three <laughs> on it. We might um, try to sneak some in, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I really I thought about it. Yeah, but they are things of beauty, and they are like maybe the most useful tool. Thing is, if we do adopt that code, we have to go up to five, then, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we have to go up to six. Oh, oh yes, yeah, you're correct. We have to go on six. Yeah. Oh, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, none of these piddly five headed dragons for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, other piece of art I really like, I like, like, I do like the Crimson Spore Cap. That's a nice bit of art. The Arch Lich is a really nice piece of art. I like yeah, all the, the names. Arch Lich is fun. This yeah. is, yeah, that's another one that we didn't talk about, but this is a, a sort of a something that we previewed a long time ago. Mm. Uh, on, uh, we mentioned it in Monsters Nursery One, actually, didn't we? I think. Yeah, and this is finally the, you know, the lich that will keep players awake on. I think. Mm. But well, another piece of art that I that uh, I sneaky like a lot is the heartless hag, mm. who just has real kind of like a a, a Jolene energy. <laughs> uh, a really nice. Uh, okay, <laughs> he's going to steal um, your man. Uh, yeah, so r real, really, uh, real Dolly Parton hair. Uh, <laughs> I think that that one is a really fun one. Hey, I, I'm just like, uh, yeah, you got to check this one out when you get the book. Flip open to H. Mm. Uh, absolutely, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
What's we got? We've got, we've got dragons. We've got more dragons. We've done a lot more with dragons in this one. Today, for yeah. one, dragons. Yeah. Should we talk yeah. a little bit about the dragons? What have we done with the dragons? You know, I counted up this morning how many great worms we have, and great worms are the, uh, you know, the age category greater than ancient. Mm-hmm. We had a couple in Monstrous Menagerie one. We have thirteen in this one. Wow, that's a lot. So yeah, a lot of them are. We better, we better finish our our work. We we, we want to have a a great worm version of everybody who's in mm. Monstrous Menagerie one, and plus we have got a couple new dragon families. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the Fey Dragon, Jessica. Got the purple of course, we have um, Mausolith, we also mentioned, uh, purple dragons and spirit dragons. We we got a lot. Plus, my favorite, the, the dragon wormling, who I plan to have on my, uh, my arm like a falcon in the next <laughs> time I play. And yeah, these are always fun to do. You get to make all the members of the, of the family so you can fight, fight these guys no matter what, no yeah. matter what level you are. Who, who doesn't love dragons? Everyone loves dragons. I love dragons. Oh yeah, and of course we have two two headed dragons, and this is sort of not just like our dragons have two heads, but let's mix together some of the different powers, breath weapons of a couple of different dragons and come out with something new. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these are uh, elite dragons, which means that they're just about twice as hard as a standard one. You know, if 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 you, if you don't like it when the dragon hits on their recharge roll and breathes their breath weapon, what if they hit on two recharge yeah. rolls? That would ruin your day. Yes. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that there's a higher proportion. It's not all high-level creatures, but there's a higher proportion of high-level creatures in this one. Mm-hmm. With our named entities, with our great worms, with the whole system for leveling up creatures, you know, it is... Right. Because uh, I think that Events 5e is sort of at a point where it's it's becoming mature mm-hmm. as a game system. And so there's a lot of people who have reached high level. Mm. So it sort of makes sense to have Monstrous Menagerie 2 support those people. Mm. You know, Monstrous Menagerie 1, we got to make sure we've got the basics. We've got a lot of low-level monsters. And I just want to make sure that no matter what level you are, there's going to be something you can use. Yeah. 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 Well, so we got the Cowcoy. The Cowcoy are back. Yeah. 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 They're creepier than ever. Yeah. So, the cowboy, for those who don't know, basically wasp like creatures which haunt the multiverse, hunting down gods and consuming their divine essence, essentially. Um, so the, even the gods, even the gods are afraid of them. Oh, yeah. Wasp, I, gods, in real, in real life, who, what's worse than a wasp? They're going to ruin your picnic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they are. Oh, yeah. Those dossets. Yeah, picnic. Eat your god. It's it's okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those damn cowcoy. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. So we got we got cowcoy soldiers, and then we got the apex cowcoy. <laughs> right. Oh, so. Yeah. The apex is is gross. We've touched on before. I think we talked about a little bit about it. it's. It's also an elite monster, and just when you think you've got it beat, it bursts open and it spills <laughs> out. These horrible little spitting blade larva type things. Mm. Uh, oh. This is one of the ones that my my players particularly mentioned as rubbing their hands in delight at the thought of, of this <laughs> going out to the rest of the world. It reminds me of there's a spider that it carries all its babies on its back. And so if you stamp on it, the babies just go everywhere. <laughs> right. and it's terrifying. Mm, yeah. I think it's, it's so in Australia. Horrible. So it, it yeah. had that moment for me where you're like, ha ha, got it. Oh my God. All this stuff everywhere. <laughs> well, I've just made things worse right. myself. Yeah. 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 Right. There's, there's, there's normal, there's epic, and there's Australian. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So this is an Australian level. This is the Australian. The Cowboy Apex thing. is an Australian level. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. They've gone Australian. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the tagline for Monsters from Nagy 3. <laughs> Do <Crikey>. back to Australia. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> Yeah. Um. So yeah, we're on Kickstarter now. We launched on Tuesday. We have over a thousand backers now. Yeah. Which is awesome. Which is amazing. We've still got twenty seven days to go, but it's doing really well. We're really, really happy with how this is doing. Yes. Especially like the video made by Jessica. Yeah, yeah it looks great. Very, very cool video. I Although I did have, I did have some suggestions. So you know, 
Yeah, you did edit it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. But yeah, no, it's, it's fun for this because we had so much good artwork. I think when you're putting a video together, it's so much easier when you just have really nice art pieces mm. put in because then you're just doing transitions and, and you know, finding a way to, to chop it and tell the story. But having awesome art just made it so much easier too. Yeah. yeah. And it's obviously Ian publishing policy not to use AI art. So. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. so, I, I just like to reassure listeners who might have somehow missed in previous. Yeah, well, episode. we're now at the point where you have to say that every single time now. Absolutely. Like on our Kickstarter page, we've literally got a section yeah. saying this is not AI art. This is all made by people, and you, we're right. at the point where you have to do that now. Yeah, so we've got the cover artist listed on the Kickstarter page, and obviously all the interior art is listed in the in the credits on the front page. So when you get your digital copy, and some of the artists have been posting on their social media actually with pictures mm. of their artwork yeah, I saw and that. links yeah. to it. So if you're online in that space, you'll be able to see some of the amazing people that we worked with yeah. for this project. It, it's it's cruelty free to it's cruelty free to everyone involved except your players. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's very That's true. Right. They know what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Enjoy, but, ignore my adventure hooks, will you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Paul, you have to pick a favourite monster then. Oh, which one from this book? Favourite while you're at it. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> you can have one per tier if you want. No. <laughs> well, that's like five favourite monsters. You know, we, we we've talked about some of my favourites. One which is is really fun by Sarah Brefogel is the Carcines, and they're the, the crab monster. They're sort of based on this thing that happens in the real world, in, in zoology, where mm. I, I think that crabs have evolved multiple times. Yeah, I've everything heard that. becomes a crab. a crab. Everything becomes a crab. Yeah. Uh, and so th- this is a, a species of intelligent crabs who want to hasten that process. <laughs> <laughs> so they... They take people and turn them into crabs. So we've got like, you know, a template. We've got crab, a crab frost giant who's been like operated on by the Carcines. And they're a really fun sort of undersea villain that I really like a lot. Wow, that is is very cool. I do like that. But you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, one of my, just for pure satisfaction, uh, we've got some new methods. And, you know, methods like low-level uh, elementals. Mm. And we've got some kind of interesting new methods. And my favorite one might be the new ice method that rides an ice sled that explodes if it runs into something. I uh, use that image they, on the Kickstarter video because they are very cool, yeah. <laughs> I love the art for that. They can't slow down. You know, they live short but exciting lives. And just like the tactical fun of that and the hilarity of the, you know, the method screaming by you and then like oh they looks like they hit the wall yeah 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 i'm so excited about this book it is it is gorgeous it's amazing oh, 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 yeah it'll be really fun to to actually get the book yes yeah well people will have the book well the pdf of the book on the 12th of december mm-hmm. i mean it's Time basically for christmas. It's, it's basically done now you know i've been looking through frank's awesome looking pages and it's just so proofreading good. now, isn't it? That fun, that fun last slow stage. Yes, yeah. yeah. But this, this, you know, this has been written and proofread and edited and all, you know, mm. all already. Right. So yeah, another shout out to William Fisher, who's mm. the, the lead editor and does an amazing job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think on that note, because it is coming up to four o'clock now, mm-hmm. we should get out of here and have a weekend. Indeed. And lead everyone to rush over to the Monstrous Menagerie 2 Hordes and Heroes Kickstarter and back it right now if you haven't already. Yes. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be on. Thanks, guys. It is always a pleasure. It is it's always a pleasure, Paul. I'm very convinced of it. And Paul, thank you so much. Well, gracious with your wisdom wisdom as ever. And I hope you get better soon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's right. You would thought being some kind of angel, you would have this natural healing ability that would just... Uh, well, what, you know, the, we do have a calcoid problem in our neighborhood. Oh, so I well, think that might be part of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you've got calcoid problems for my office, I've got nine of problems with calcoid. <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, they're largely six of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Not on that note. Thank you all. And we'll be back same time next week. I will not Bye-bye. be here. You That's will not right. be here? I'm just going to be here. Oh. Why will you not be here? I'm off a LARPing. Oh. Woo.
Oh, uh, this time times. I'll be wearing a Regency ball gown oh, and going to my first ever ball, which my character thinks everything will be fine because my main goals are to have a very nice time and secure a marriage. But I, as a player, know it's got a Cthulhu twist in it, so I suspect <laughs> she will not have a largely great time. <laughs> Right, well, that sounds really fun. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I've been mauled by dogs constantly throughout this podcast, as you can see. Yes. Um, yes. Preston be... has a being attacked as a hero across being attacked. Yeah. Can you please? Can you please? Oh. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so we shall leave you all for this week fairly well. Yes. Au revoir. Au revoir.